Hello, welcome to the Friday, April 8th, 2022 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. I wrote a quick post today about BIMI, and I hope I pronounce it correctly. It's an acronym, B-I-M-I, and it stands for Brand Indicators for Message Identification. And it's supposed to uh, supplement the more technical standards like uh, DMARC, DKIM, SPF in order to provide users with an easier way to detect if a particular email is legitimate or not. Now, the trick here is that essentially the email sender is able to identify a logo that will be added in the email client next to the email, typically already in the preview pane. And this is supposed to help users decide that a particular email is coming from an actual organization. Now, how is it all supposed to work and how are people not supposed to be able to fake those images? Well, uh, first of all, you need a special DNS records. Everything about these email standards usually evolves around DNS text records. In this case, the most basic form just includes a URL for the image. Of course, that's something that could easily be faked. Uh, Someone else uh, could just copy the image, create the text record for a lookalike domain, and impersonate the particular uh, entity. But an extension uh, to this standard then also allows for a certificate to be added. And this is where things get a little bit more tricky and more difficult to implement. In order to obtain a certificate that will be trusted, you first need a trademark for that particular image, and that sort of makes sense. And then you need, of course, to buy the certificate. And that's currently, in my opinion at least, pretty expensive. It's sort of in the $1,000 to $1,500 range. And it's, of course, yet another certificate that you need to renew annually. Of course, the next part to this is uh, will email clients actually support the standard? And here, Yahoo is behind the standard, but very notably, neither Microsoft nor Apple have supported the standard so far. And that, of course, takes away to huge user bases. Without them, the standard is probably not going to make it, in my opinion. Google indicated that they will support it, but they're not supporting it right now. So a nice idea that I think uh, does uh, try to solve a real problem in making it easier for users uh, to really uh, decipher all these sort of complex uh, email issues. But then again, it sort of runs into the old problem. How are we scaling actually uh, the proof that someone belongs to a particular organization? TLS never really did that quite right. EV certificates try to solve some of this, but uh, that really uh, didn't work. And of course, existing TLS certificates will verify a host name, but not that the host name belongs to a particular organization. And then a little follow on uh, to uh, the response to the Cyclops uh, Blink botnet by the FBI. I talked about it yesterday that the FBI did disrupt the command and control servers for uh, this uh, botnet. So the botnet is no longer active, but any affected firewalls may still be infected. And of course, they may still be vulnerable. In particular, for WatchGuard devices, WatchGuard did uh, compile a very extensive FAQ and a process to really clean your system if it was affected by Cyclops Blink. They also did now release that there is a specific vulnerability, CVE 2022-23176, that was used by this botnet. This vulnerability was not officially sort of announced before uh, yesterday, but it was patched in May 2021, so about a year ago. 
but just applying the patch is not going uh, to remove any existing malware. So uh, definitely double check your systems, follow WatchGuard's response guide here, and do make sure that your system is up to date. Because of course it's very possible that attackers are going to use the list of infected devices that they may already have to then reinfect them with the next version of whatever malware they're coming up with. And well, finally, the attackers have found the advantages of serverless computing in making it more difficult for a defender to actually find malicious code. Security company Cato came across a crypto coin miner written in Go that's being deployed as an AWS Lambda function. And with that, of course, the attacker needs to have first access to deploy the Lambda. So this is likely some kind of compromised cloud environment that is then, of course, uh, being used to mine these uh, crypto coins at the cost of whoever owns the account. Cato does provide some indicators of compromise, but what it really comes down to is to make sure that you are aware of what lambdas are running and essentially uh, billing time to your account. Well, it's Friday again, and uh, with me today, I have another uh, sans.edu student. Uh, Ashley, uh, could you just uh, introduce yourself, please? Sure. Thanks for inviting me. My name is Ashley Taylor, and I work for a medical device manufacturing company. I am an enterprise cybersecurity manager now, and I am also one of the STI master students just heading into my last and final year. Last and final year, how exciting. Now, you had an interesting topic, and I think the topic is also interesting because it sort of hits a little bit the social issues kind of you know, it's not just technology that gets us into trouble sometimes it's also how people perceive technology and such uh, can you explain a little bit uh, what the problem was that you sort of addressed in your paper we had an interesting problem happen where i work we received an email from somebody who is applying to jobs at our company and they received an interview and an acceptance letter from our recruiter. But it wasn't actually our recruiter. It was a criminal pretending to be one of our recruiters on LinkedIn. And what they were doing is posting fake job descriptions, interviewing people, getting all of their information, having them fill out or their I-9 information, and sending all this PII to them, and then even going as far as sending them an acceptance letter. But it had nothing to do with our company whatsoever. So for your company, I guess the main problem there is sort of a reputation issue because you have now people calling you, thinking they have a job, expecting a paycheck, and you have nothing to give to them. Uh, not that you're legally obligated to do anything uh, for them, but it basically just looks bad for your company. Uh, did the bad guys here get anything else uh, but uh, PII? So they were able to get uh, everything that you would normally hand over for a job. So social security number, resumes, uh, addresses, everything. And they even went so far with some people who fell for the scam as sending them uh, a check or money and telling them to go purchase equipment so that they can start working for the company. Uh, and when they went to the sites to purchase the equipment, it just basically, they gave them their credit card, handed over their information, stole money from them. <laughs> but obviously the check bounced. So it's kind of sad that uh, you know people are not only getting scammed out of their PII, but also out of some money. And likely people who could use that money because, well, after all, they were applying for a job. Uh, any warning signs here that people should be aware of that a job offer like this may be fake or a job opportunity may be fake? There are some things that uh, we've been able to. Unfortunately, uh, it would be nice if we could just go on to LinkedIn and ZipRecruiter, use an API and look for any sorts of job descriptions, but they are not very open with that information or ability to search. Uh, another thing we were able to identify 
was a lot of these scammers pretending to be our company would set up a similar or typo squat domains such as our company dash careers.com so they could send emails and create these job descriptions and make it look very believable actually yeah and uh, you know i've seen it too where companies do set up legitimate domains like that or if they're using a service like ZipRecruiter or such, where in order to direct users to that service, they're using custom domains, makes it easier with email filtering and all the DMARC stuff and such that happens these days to set up a specific uh, domain for that. Uh, so you looked for type of squatting domains. Is this one way how you sort of identified uh, these, these scams? When we received the email complaint, it was from our HR department, which it's easy to take that stuff and say, well, that's HR's problem. Let them (laughs) deal with it. But we realized we were actually receiving that intel through a product that we use that would let us know whenever a typo squat or similar domain was being registered. And after talking with some of these victims, we were able to see that they were all falling uh, for the same sort of scammer uh, that was targeting them. And they always used a typo squad or similar domain in this case. It made it a little easier for us to create some detections around that and some workflows to help us alert our HR, legal, and recruiting teams, which they in turn would then add to our job descriptions or our company site. So hopefully, if people are doing proper research on a company they're applying for, they would see, oh, this this domain isn't related to the company. Uh, this has to be fake. <laughs> I think that's a good precaution in general to sort of do some research on a company uh, if you're applying for a job. Uh, Typically also makes for a better job interview if you are uh, going for a real job interview. (laughs) Now, uh, of course, at this point, you're sort of trying to outrun the attacker somewhat. Uh, Do you know some of the timelines were involved? Like uh, after registering the domain, how long did it take the attacker to actually lure victims into their scams? We weren't able to discern that just because we didn't, we weren't aware of the attack until the victims reached out to us. We could see when the domains were registered, uh, but from our intel, they actually targeted dozens of victims, like maybe even more than that. And uh, the ones that reached out to us from the time the domain was created to the time they reached out to us was about a couple months, which, uh, so that campaign could have been active for that entire time. After the first victim reached out, though, suddenly we got a flood of them. So I like to think maybe they put it in place and held off, hopefully. Um, but it's hard to say. But a couple of months, that should give you enough time uh, if you do have that service that alerts you of type of squatting domains to, uh, to hopefully do something against this. Since, <laughs> since you are able now to detect these domains sort of proactively any luck in like taking down these domains or or how are you reacting once you're seeing uh, one of those type of squad domains yes we actually very shortly after i finished the paper we had one come through uh for a domain register that's uh, name cheap they're being very good about taking down active campaigns now And our workflow puts together an executive summary report, which includes all that extra good intelligence that we receive on the domain. We were able to identify it wasn't one of ours, send that report to Namecheap, and within 20 minutes, that domain was taken offline. That's great. Uh, That's a great success there. I think Namecheap even has an API where you can automate some of those takedown requests there really proactive in that sense. Uh, Yeah, so uh, any final words? So what did you learn from this or uh, anything you learned since you made, since you published the paper? I've learned since I published the paper that I I think this is going to become an attack vector that's a lot more popular. I've since seen the FBI put out a couple more advisories around this topic. I've seen it addressed in some of our uh, ISAC or information sharing networks. It's 
something that is going to start affecting a lot of companies. And I think it's an interesting attack vector that we don't always think we can uh, do things about in cybersecurity because it seems more of a people problem outside of our control. But with some creative solutions, we can at least give intelligence to our companies to make better solutions and, and hopefully help victims uh, stay uh, not victims to this sort of attack. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, thanks for joining me here, Ashley. And a link to the paper will be in the show notes. I realize that probably most people listening to this won't fall for it, uh, but this is one of those things where uh, getting some awareness out, telling your family and friends about it uh, will hopefully uh, prevent some further uh, damage. Uh, thanks, Ashley. Yes, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Very excited. <laughs> Well, and that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.